civil engineer. My mom was a registered nurse at the VA down here for years. Middle class family. My parents sacrificed everything for us kids to go to school. Um, and a hardworking middle class family. We valued our freedom and our God-given rights. We were raised to love God and our country and treat others the way that we wanted to be treated. Uh, my father um, was a man of his word, and he still is. And he taught me as a woman that I can be and do anything that I want to be. So my first introduction to Islam and Sharia law began in college at Idaho State University in Pocatello. I met a charming, good-looking foreigner named Ibrahim. He was from Lebanon. He was raised in Catholic boarding schools, but he was Muslim. He was a moderate Muslim who drank his scotch on the rocks, loved American music and American women. He was four years my senior, and he was as worldly as I was naive. When he told me he was a Muslim, you know, back then you got to understand we didn't have Google search, we didn't even have cell phones, so everything he said to me about Islam and his country and his belief system, I got just from him. I'm 21 years old and I never traveled outside of Idaho and Montana and I never had any friends outside of the United States, so I pretty much took his word at what he said. Um, he assuaged my fears by telling me that we had more in common with each other than I thought, he was feeding me the spiel about Christians come from Isaac and Muslims come from Ishmael, which is total Balarney, as Pastor Tom will tell you. Um, I didn't know anything about taqiyya then, which is the right of a Muslim to lie to non-Muslims to propagate their faith. I had no idea what that was. So he could have been telling me anything. Um, a man's word meant nothing in his religion when talking to a non-believer. He has the right to deceive and lie about his faith. So anyway, I fell in love. Abraham convinced me to elope. And he was actually kind of pushing for this. I thought it was love. But looking back, his student visa was running out. And he needed a you know, chance to stay in America. Therefore, the green card getting married. I was There I was, the sitting duck, right? And please know that under Islam, that Muslims are allowed to marry non-Muslims as long as they are chaste women of the Jewish faith or the Christian faith. And um, Muslim women, of course, cannot marry outside their faith. They are sentenced to death for it. They are beaten. Um, there, I can cite many examples. Uh, Marianne Sudan was convicted of apostasy and sentenced to death with 100 lashes for marrying a Christian man and she was eight months pregnant. Um, she, was lived, she was married three years to her Christian husband and they didn't even recognize it. Um, some women are just killed because they disagree with their daughter's choice and who they marry. <laughs> Zanit Rafiq in Lahore, Pakistan was doused with fuel and set alight by her own mother and brother because they disagreed with who she was going to marry. Can you imagine having that much control over your daughters and who they marry? I wouldn't want that. This total subjugation of women is allowed under Sharia law. So anyway, as I described in my book, we got married. Um, it started out pretty good. The red flags were waving, but course I ignored them. Um, in 
and things were fine until we had children. My first daughter was born. Um, her name was Layla, and I'll never forget it. Um, he held her, her little ear to his mouth, and he said the Adhan called a prayer in Islam, which is, you know, Allah is the greatest. Come to Allah and come to pray and worship and all that. Um, I ignored these warning signs, and I continued to take her church to it with me. We were married in my church, by the way, and he agreed to raise my children Christian. Um, but that changed, however, when the children were born. So I continued to take her to church with me. He had stopped. But when she was about three years old, he stopped me one morning and said, Layla will not be going with you to church anymore. She will be raised Muslim. His mother had just visited us from Kuwait and Lebanon, and so I'm sure he got a lecture. So I protested, but he threatened to get violent. So I, at that point, decided to teach my children my Christian faith in secret behind his back because I knew if he saw what I was doing, I didn't want to get the repercussions for that. Five years later, I was pregnant again with another daughter, Nadine, and things went from bad to worse. And even at this point, I still didn't understand how different our belief systems were. I'm coming from the Christian perspective, where marriage is a covenant between one man and one woman. You forsake all others. <laughs> and in Christian belief, a Christian man is supposed to lay down their wife for their husband. In contrast, marriage in Islam is a contract. A man simply gives his wife a dowry that literally buys the man the right to manage and control her. If you're a good Muslim man, you're the patriarch, the master, and everyone dances around you. And under Islam, you have the right to beat your wife, but only if she doesn't do what you ask. And there is no such thing as forsaking all others. You take more wives and take temporary marriages. Two totally different belief systems about marriage, two totally different actions towards women. If you believe that women are inferior to men and can be used and expelled at your discretion, that you, then you will treat them like that. If you believe that you have the right to beat your wife, you may do it. If you believe in mutah, a temporary pleasure marriage in Islam where you can marry any woman from one hour to 99 years and have relations with her for a price, you will practice what I call holy prostitution with willing subjects. My ex-husband did this a lot behind my back. But still ignorant about all of this, I continued to believe the best, and I prayed for him to change. But I really didn't realize what I was up against, because in Islam, he's under Sharia law no matter where he lived. And if he decided to leave Islam, he would be given three days to repent, and if he didn't, he would be completely cut off from his family at the very least, or he could be killed by a family member for apostasy. So one day, after about 13 years of marriage, he told me that he wanted to move us back home to his country, Beirut, Lebanon. I told him, absolutely not. And when I saw him making plans to do it anyway, I decided to divorce him. But when I did my research, calling the consular of Bureau, uh, Bureau of Consular Affairs here in America, I quickly realized I was trapped. Because America allows dual citizenship. And he could leave the country any time with them on Lebanese passports. And there was nothing I could do because the U.S. has no exit controls. I could try full sole custody at that point, but I kept all these years of abuse a secret, and I would look like a vindictive woman just trying to get sole custody of my daughters. And he would have some visitation rights, and he would take the girls on those visitations, and he would fly off. This happens to a lot of women. Um, if I could stop dual citizenship, I would. I was contacted by the State Department after I got back from Beirut, and I was too busy just trying to survive and you know do my own thing. But that issue came about, and that was when Bush was president. Um, because if my husband didn't have dual citizenship, he would not have a Lebanese passport for him and my daughters to leave. So, you know, America remains an immigrant's beacon. Immigrants come to the United States legally and illegally at the rate of about a million per year. There are now over 34 million foreign-born persons living here, the largest number in American history. And unlike the past, many immigrants to the U.S. now arrive from countries with very different cultural, religious, psychological, and political traditions than ours. So a natural question arises as to how well these millions of new immigrants are finding their place in American society. The heart of the American national community, its foundation, it consists of emotional attachments, a warmth and affection for, an appreciation of, a pride and a commitment and responsibility towards this country's institution what we call patriotism. And therein lies the core of the problem of dual citizenship and multiple national attachments. 
Unlike many other nations, American citizenship is not based on race, religious, or ethnic identity. It is based instead on political loyalty to, to American constitutional democracy. People from anywhere in the world can become Americans. But if our great historical success in assimilating millions of immigrants is going to continue, ultimately newcomers must be loyal to the U.S. Constitution and not to any other law. Um, at this point, I just want to mention my husband's father. You know, he laid his life on the line for this country. At 17 years old, he signed up for World War II. You have to be 18. He lied about his age to go in there. He went over the Philippines. He was shot and left for dead. He was bayoneted. He still has bullets in him. And he received the Purple Heart Award. You don't find that very often anymore. That's patriotism. And I want to tell you, I watched my ex-husband, when he became a U.S. citizen, take the oath of citizenship. And I'm just going to read it to you so you know what it is. I'm sure most of you do. <laughs> I hereby declare on oath that I absolutely and entirely renounce and abjure all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince, potentate, state, or sovereignty, of whom or which I have heretofore been a subject or citizen, that I will support and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States of America against all enemies. And you stand there like this. I mean, you know. Foreign and domestic, and I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I will bear arms on behalf of the U.S. when required by law, that I will perform non-combatant service in the armed forces of the U.S. when required by law, that I will perform work of national importance under civil civilian direction, when required by the law, and that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, so help me not. Well, the Obama administration recently made changes to this oath of allegiance in a manner very conducive to Sharia law. On July 21st, the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service announced some modifications. A candidate to U.S. citizenship may exclude the following two clauses based on religious training, belief, or conscientious objection. They can leave out bear arms on behalf of the United States, and they can leave out perform non-combatant service in the armed forces of the United States when required by law. This is a concession to Sharia law. For while Sharia law allows Muslims to fake loyalty to non-Muslim infidel authorities, we had a male escort. He became even more violent with me and my daughters, exerting his right to beat us into submission if we disobeyed him. I tiptoed around his ever-increasing agitation an angry outburst knowing that under Islam, women's number one priority is to please their husbands. Because here he could marry another woman behind my back. He could get rid of me. He could send me back home on an airplane without my daughters. If he divorced me under Sharia law, my daughters would automatically go to him, and he would owe me nothing. He even registered our daughters under the family name, telling me that they belong to the family now. I found out that I was quickly becoming an embarrassment to the family because I refused to give up my Christian faith. So one of his brothers was called in to try to convert me. And when it didn't work out, his family began to withdraw from me. Layla, my oldest, was about nine years old at this time. She was put in a Muslim school where other children spit in her face and called her an American, Yahmada, which means whore. And I could do nothing about it but comfort her when she came home. She was nine years old, the age when Islam saw her as a woman, allowed to be married, and he began demanding that she wear the hijab to cover herself and start praying Islamically. Nadine, my normally outgoing, outspoken child, now clung to me fearfully, never letting me out of her sight. His mother started parading young veiled virgins in front of my husband, trying to convince him to take another wife. And keep in mind, when they visited us in America, they put on a good show, I guess. They pretended to like me. I went out of my way. I drove them everywhere. And just we treated them with love. But when I arrived in their country, there was no one there to greet me. No welcome to this American woman who was giving up everything to follow her husband. Absolutely nothing. I was the infidel. I was the outsider. And it's interesting over there on the TV, their commercials and everything, very often they show a statue of Liberty with blood all over her. Um, they, my mother-in-law handed out comic books to my daughters, which I still have showing on Jews as evil, despicable beings. Um, one thing that really got to me was we were in the kitchen one day, and I saw my husband with his keys, and on this keychain was a, it was a new keychain. I said, let me see that. And I looked at it, and I go, that's the Twin Towers. I said, who gave that to you? And he goes, my mother. She handed them out to everybody. And I saw it for what it was. It was a badge of honor. You know, we got them, right? Mm -hmm. Badge of honor. So one hot summer day, 
I was not working out. I was not being the... I stayed home. I cooked. I cleaned. I never left the building. But I was Christian, and I refused to convert. So one hot summer day, he approached me and said, my family is not accepting you. And I said, what, what do you mean your family is not accepting me? This, this is something that you say before you get married. You know, I've been married to you for 14 years. I do everything you tell me to do. I, I don't understand. And um, he said, well, we don't accept you for three reasons. Number one, you're Christian. Number two, you're American. And number three, you're not even Arabic. I knew then that decisions were being made to get rid of me fast and that my time was short. I had seen other American and European children over there where their mothers were sent home without them. And their fathers had new wives, wives with real mothers sent back, you know, to, to raise those kids. So when he told me he was visiting Kuwait for two weeks to find a new job, I realized this was my opportunity to escape. I put my plan into action and I called the U.S. Embassy in Lebanon. And the first thing I realized, she asked me, are you on the travel blacklist? And I had no idea what that was. And I said, I have no idea. So I had to wait until she figured out if I was on that blacklist, because I would still be over there if he had. I realized this was not going to be easy. I had to somehow convince my husband to let me drive the girls to school while he was gone so I could drive to the embassy and eventually to the airport to escape. It was a series of setbacks. It, wasn't, it was really hard. It was a narrow escape, and my book describes the perils I faced, but extraordinary measures were taken by the U.S. government to get me out, and I am eternally grateful because I am not sure if I, if I was there now under our current president, if I would have escaped or been able to get out. But make no mistake, God is the hero of this story. I wouldn't be here today without his intervention. And there's another interesting story. As we finally get on the airplane and we're heading back, or er, the plane hasn't taken off yet, Nadine's four, Layla's nine, and she starts to put her seatbelt on and she realizes that we're on an airplane. And she goes, Mommy, where are we going? And I said, honey, we're going to America. And she said, she takes off her seatbelt, stands up in her seat, and she goes, no. She goes, America's evil. America's satanic. You know, sat satanic. And I was like, oh, my gosh. And all the passengers start laughing. And Layla turns to her and says, no, Natalie, we're going to English land to see Grammy and Grandpa. And she goes, oh, okay. And she sits back down. But I was shocked. That child was with me 24-7, and somehow she had been indoctrinated to hate America. My little four-year-old. My tiny little four-year-old. You know, my story has a happy ending, but there are so many others whose stories did not end up like mine. So this is why I believe it's important to understand what Islam is all about and what Sharia law is and how we should never as Americans allow it to be implemented here, ever, for the sake of our daughters and their children. And it's important to know our place as women in this world, that it is not a place of weakness and abuse, but a place of strength and dignity and respect. Every accommodation non-Muslims make for Muslims moves our culture, our beliefs, and our legal system one step closer to Sharia law. This is direct, a direct quote from Bill Warner in his book, Sharia Law for Non-Muslims. For example, you know, a lot of people say, well, the Muslims are great. They love their faith. They love Muhammad. They defend him to, to, you know, to the last death. When someone insults their religion, they get upset. Why aren't we Christians like that? I'll tell you why. Because under Sharia law, it's forbidden to criticize Islam or Muhammad. It's part of Sharia law. Forbidding criticism of any religion is not a precept of a free society or of any Western civilization. So to whatever degree Muslims succeed in silencing our criticisms of Islam to that degree, they have imposed Sharia law on non-Muslims. It's time we stop tiptoeing around them. We need to wake up, America. Obama and his administration does this very well. See no jihad, hear no jihad, speak no jihad. They have come down with a severe case of JDS, jihad denial syndrome. The primary direction of Islam is not to convert everybody, but to bring everybody on earth under the rule of Sharia law, whether they like it or not. And it's happening right under our noses. I just have a few examples here. There, there are thousands, believe me. Um, one example, the UN passed a resolution banning criticism of Islam, United Nations. Um, Muslims get segregated toilets in Austria at Melbourne Monash University. Germany and Belgium give welfare benefits to Muslim polygamists' various wives looking the other way. 
Canada, public school, public swimming pools are closed to non-Muslims so Muslim women can swim in privacy. Halal meat is now in France in grocery stores. I'm not sure if you're familiar with halal meat, but that's the way that um, the cow or the lamb, whatever is butchered, it has to be a Muslim that does it. They slit the throat so the animal bleeds to death. PETA has come up against it because it's very inhumane to animals. Um, but it's a $7 billion industry in France. That's why they do it. And the leftovers they put in the, in the grocery stores and don't tell you that it's halal. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't want halal meat. I don't want meat that's offered to a foreign god. You know, I, just, I, I think that's so wrong. Under Sharia law, in a majority Muslim country, non-Muslims are not equal to Muslims. They must comply to Islamic law if they are to remain safe, convert or pay the tax. They're forbidden to marry Muslim women, publicly display wine or pork, recite their scriptures, or openly celebrate their religious holidays or funerals. They are forbidden from building new churches or building them higher than mosques. They may not enter a mosque without permission. A non-Muslim is no longer protected if he leads a Muslim away from Islam. Do we, as Americans, really want this in America? To be treated as second-class citizens? You know, there's one thing that really irks me how the women's rights activists who claim to be activists for women and children's rights ignore the abuse of women and children under Islam. It really irks me. Under Sharia law, rebelliousness on the part of the wife nullifies the husband's obligation to support her. There is no community property between husband and wife, and the husband's property does not automatically go to the wife after his death. A woman loses custody of her children in divorce. To prove rape, a woman must have four male witnesses, and often when a woman is raped, she's stoned to death. Domestic violence is a crime still here in America, but not necessarily so in Sharia tribunal courts. Do we want this in America? There can be no place for complacency driven by multi multicultural political correctness. The Australian feminist academic Sheila Jeffrey says, it is an unacceptable and dangerous fallacy that second class human rights for Muslim women are good enough for them, simply because they happen to be Muslim. It would be a grotesque if those who chose to speak up about the plight of Muslim women are accused of Islamophobia. The true bigots are those who find the sexual abuse of Muslim women to be multiculturally acceptable. Creeping Sharia law is here. Cases in courts here in America and in Europe, judges are allowing Sharia law and Islamic culture to help them make decisions regarding custody, marriage, and even abuse. There are over 85 Sharia tribunals in England right now. And Muslims will be quick to tell you, well, the law of the land supersedes Sharia law. But they won't tell you the ugly truth that these women they're not going to narc on their um, clerics. They're not going to. They're going to go to their clerics, and they're not going to go to anybody else for help. They're going to listen to them. I don't know if you've read the book, um, *The Imam's Daughter* by Hannah Shaw. <coughs> Anybody read that book? It's about a Pakistani young girl who lived in England as the daughter of a local imam. Her father abused her for years in the basement of their house, and the family did nothing. You know, a teacher finally noticed that there was something wrong with her. And so she got involved and she took her to her social worker, who was also Pakistani, Muslim. And so she, she opened up her heart and she trusted him, told him the story of what her dad was doing. And the first thing he did was go and tell her dad. And she was abused even more because of it. Why? Because this Muslim Pakistani man saw Sharia law above the law of the land. At 16, she was going to be forced into a um, marriage overseas. They were going to send her over there. She escaped. She um, became Christian. And she's still today being hunted by her brother and her father. The worst abuse in my mind, however, is that Sharia law allows forced marriages of little girls, sometimes to men that are as old as their grandfathers. There's no age limit for marriage of girls. The marriage contract can take place any time after birth and it can be consummated at age eight or nine. This is sexual trafficking. Prue Goward, the New South Wales Minister for the Community Services and Women has reported that there are about a thousand cases a year across, across Australia of women and girls being trafficked into forced marriages. She stated, no ethnic group has a monopoly on violence against women, but some groups experience violence against women disproportionately, speaking about Islam. In Lebanon alone, UNICEF determined at least 
of little Lebanese girls are married before 18. This is 37,000 child brides every year. In Lebanon, under Sharia law, a parent can give their permission for their daughter to be married at the age of nine. And this is Christian, this is a Christian Muslim country. This is not even Saudi Arabia or Pakistan or anything like that. These child brides are more likely to suffer from domestic violence and rarely go to school. The second and third leading cause of death to these child, child, child brides is childbirth and suicide. And some of these marriages are never registered with the state. An investigation in the UK identified 18 mosques, around one third of those approached by the reporter, where clerics were willing to conduct a wedding of a 14 year old girl against her will. In Britain, the Crown Prosecutor in the north of England has reported that there are estimated to be 8,000 to 10,000 forced marriages or threats of forced marriages of people against their will in the UK each year. A British government survey found that hundreds of girls aged 11 to 13 had simply disappeared from school roles. What is mind-blowing to me is that multicultural, open-mindedness ideals prevalent in British society have made the authorities reluctant to criminalize this practice. This gives rise to a two-tiered system. So these Muslim women living in England have different rights than the rest of them? That can't be right. These clerics who perform unregistered forced religious marriages should be stripped of their licenses to conduct marriages, denied tax-deductible charitable status. They should be charged with criminal offenses under anti-trafficking and anti-pedophilia legislation. Great Britain seems to have the attitude of multiculturalism and political correctness. You know, it reminds me of that saying, he who stands for nothing will fall for anything. Or as my grandma used to say, um, don't be so open-minded that your brains fall out. <laughs> my grandma had some great sayings. So when I escaped, it was about, it was September 16, 2002. It'll be 14 years in a couple of days that we will be celebrating. I remember when I came back, it was October 2002, um, I saw the story of Angie Abdullah in the Idaho Statesman front page. Do any of you remember that story? Yeah, I'm, she was a kind-hearted woman who worked with refugees. She worked for the Idaho Refugee Services Program. She converted to Islam and married Azad Abdullah, a refugee from Kurdistan. It was front page story. She was murdered and the local mosque was blaming a hate, that it was a hate crime, Islamophobes that killed her in response to 9-11 or something like that. And I remember looking at that and saying out loud to my parents, this is not a hate crime. Her husband killed her. And my mom says, oh, no, no. My friend works with Azad, and he's a really nice guy. He's kind. He's friendly. And I looked at my mom again, and I said, no, he did it. Well, the papers later confirmed that I was right. Angie was seeking a divorce from him, and they were arguing about financial matters and property. Because see, in his country, in divorce, he gets the house, he gets the car, he gets the kids. And things were not working out that way for him here. So he took matters into his own hands. He suffocated her, put the house on fire, and pretended like he was in a different city. He is on death row right now. So he had a female judge, I believe. <laughs> yeah. The reason that I knew that he did it, because when I was in Lebanon, I heard many similar stories. Women were... Um, falling off balconies, <laughs> their stoves would blow up in front of them and kill them, drowning in their pools. And some men were just outright beat them to death until they died. And all of this with no consequences. The women over there, some women over there try, mostly the Christian women, to talk about this and they protest, but not much has changed. I remember thinking that moment, the enemy is here and no one even sees it. I wanted to shout, you know, like, is there something going on here? You guys can't even see that they're just pretending. <laughs> you know, all they see is the poor refugee. And like lambs being led to the slaughter, we humbly offer our necks to be sliced. Sometimes it's rather blatant. I don't know if you've heard the story of the five-year-old girl in Twin Falls? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Grant Loeb's. It was not Syrian refugees, but it was Sudanese and Iraqi refugees who sexually abused this five-year-old little girl covering her in urine. Thank God for Jolene Payne, an 89-year-old mother who intervened and stopped it. What's interesting about this, though, is the Obama-appointed U.S. Attorney for Idaho, Wendy Olson, took the highly unusual step of intervening in this local criminal case, threatening the community and media with federal prosecution if they spread false information or inflammatory statements about the perpetrators. 
the fox is in the hen house, as Bridget says so often. And, you know, that's the ignorance that we face today. I'm really tired of people saying, now, now, Kelly, not all Muslims are terrorists. No, not all Muslims are terrorists. Only enough of them have to be, right? Not all Germans were Nazis either. All that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. You know, the Holocaust may not have happened if more people stood up. And we honor men like in Schindler's List for what they did and many other people. And that's what we need to do here. You know, it just amazes me today that when anyone criticizes Islam or Sharia law, we're immediately labeled as bigots, racists, xenophobes, and Islamophobes. Well, I can tell you right now, I'm not a bigot. <laughs> this, a bigot is defined as one who regards or treats the members of a group like a racial or ethnic group with hatred and intolerance. I love people from all racial backgrounds, black, white. I even have Arabic friends, Christian Arabic friends. You name it. You know, as Christians, we're told to love and turn the other cheek and all that, but we're also supposed to hate what he hates. Amen. In the Bible, it says, God hates a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift and running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. Hmm. Liars? Hands that shed innocent blood? False witnesses, an evil heart, planning wicked, devising wicked plans. This could all be used to describe Islamic jihadists against the innocents, or some of our politicians. <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely not a xenophobe. For God's sake, I welcomed the foreigner, I married the foreigner, I had kids with the foreigner, I laid down my life for the foreigner. I still love foreigners. But Islamophobe? Yeah, you can call me that. <laughs> I am fearful of Islam. And I'm afraid of its ideology and its impact on its followers. I don't fear Christians. I don't fear Jews. I don't even fear Hindus. I do fear the Islam that Muslims follow. I understand that not all Muslims are dangerous, but I also understand Islam is utterly dangerous. And these two are not mutually exclusive. We need to stop ignoring the Islam effect that we're seeing in these mass killings. It's time to abandon the model, well, this isn't the real Islam. Well, the so-called real Islam has absolutely no effect whatever on stopping the wrong Islam. You know, let's put credit where credit's due. The term bigot correctly defines the ideology of Islam, one who regards or treats the members of a group with hatred and intolerance. In Saudi Arabia, the existence of Christian churches is prohibited, along with the Bible itself. No Christian or Jew can enter Mecca or Medina lest their mere footsteps desecrate Islam's holiest sites. In Pakistan and Afghanistan or elsewhere in the Muslim world, conversion from Islam to Christianity is punishable by death. In Iraq, Syria, Nigeria, Nigeria, and even the president's beloved Indonesia, Christians, Hindus, Buddhists, and other infidels often face acts of religious <coughs> genocide by fundamentalists who invoke core Islamic texts and teachings to justify their actions. You know, maybe Barack Hussein Obama won't like this, but I want to tell you why Sharia law should be outlawed in our country. It goes directly against our Constitution. Amen. Article 1, freedom of speech, assembly, press, and religion. In Islam, if you say anything against Muhammad, you can be fined, imprisoned, or killed. Under Sharia law, you do not have the right to freedom to change your religion of belief if you're a Muslim. It's not only a sin, but a religious crime to change your religion, subject to the death penalty after offering one chance to return. You know, some Islamic scholars will tell you that they disagree with this interpretation of Sharia law. But as of 2011, 20 Islamic nations have laws declaring conversion away from Islam as illegal and a criminal offense. Islam is not the religion of peace, as Obama tells us. Islam means submit. And Muslims account for more than 90% of the terrorist acts in the world today. Kill the disbelievers where you find them. Take them captive. Torture them. Quran 9.5. And I could quote that other things all day. I, and I'm really tired of waiting for the moderate Muslims to speak up. <laughs> it, it, it's not going to happen. <laughs> I'm not sure if you're familiar with Jen Shapiro and the YouTube videos that he puts out there. He, um, he puts to shame the idea that um, radical Islam is just a small minority. If you accept the most recent surveys of Muslim nations, 20% of Muslims believe in Sharia law and all its tenets and also the new jihad. 
There are 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. 20% is 314 million people. That's 314 million people who think infidels, that's you and me, should either be forced to convert or be eliminated. And this is growing exponentially. The quiet ones are performing their own little jihad, quietly supporting jihad financially through Muslim charities. So how many more children have to be decapitated before we admit that there's a problem? How many more little girls are sold into forced sexual slavery? How many more people are burned alive in cages on TV? How many innocent women burned alive or killed under honor killings? The silence from people is deafening. All I hear from people who completely ignore this growing pile of victims are just whining about the poor Muslim's reputation. Under the name of Islam, misogyny, beheadings, honor killings, terror, murder, and never-ending threats to keep us silent or on the rise. The myth of the tiny radical Muslim minority. Let's just take France, the United States, because if we do the Muslim countries, that's obvious. France has 4.7 million Muslims in 2007 poll. It showed that 35% of French Muslims said sometimes suicide bombings can be justified. That's 1.6 million radical Muslims in France. In the U.S., we have 2.6 million Muslims who live here. 13% violence against civilians can sometimes be justified. 19% said they were favorable or indifferent to Al-Qaeda. So that is at least 500,000 radical Muslims in this country. And these surveys aren't taking into account Takia, where they could lie during these surveys. <laughs> so let's use some new terminology, shall we? How about Islamofascism? Islamofascism refers to the notion that Islam is not so much a religion as it is a political ideology that in many ways resembles fascism. More specifically, Islamofascism is used to describe either the social structure of a society living under Islamic Sharia law or the interpersonal behavior of someone who acts in accordance with true Islam. Fascism and Islam have a lot in common. Fascism rejects liberal ideas such as freedom, individual rights, and often presses for the destruction of elections, legislatures, and other elements of democracy. Despite the idealistic goals of fascism, attempts to build fascist societies have led to wars and persecutions that cause millions of deaths. As a result, fascism is strongly associated with religion, religious fanaticism, racism, totalitarianism, and violence, and their will to exterminate the Jews. It's so ironic to me how the liberal media rails against the right while keeping stunningly silent on the horror that is Islam. It's pure hypocrisy. They hang homosexuals as part of mainstream Islam. They routinely stone and behead innocent women. They torture and kill dissidents. And we can stop blaming the West for radical Islam. Western culture has nothing to do with radical Islam. The Ottoman Empire invaded and conquered a huge swath of Europe, not because of what Europe did, but because the Ottoman Empire was imperialistic. Islam spread through the Middle East and Africa by the sword. You know, I don't admire Vladimir Putin, but I do admire his hard stance on Sharia law, and I think that's why Obama hates him. He said, quote, Russia will not assimilate to other cultures, so if you want to live where you can follow Sharia, I advise you to go someplace that allows it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I will say it again, the 6th century barbaric, intolerant, Islamofascist, misogynist, bigoted, intolerant, oppressive of women and children has no place in my beloved United States of America. Okay, so now, we, that's the bad news. We have, what's the call to action, right? Um, the first call to action is to educate yourself, is to read and educate your families, your kids, and other people. Read books. Bill Warner in his book, Sharia Law for Non-Muslims. Um, the Imam's Daughter, you know, about women who lived under Sharia law. Um, Robert Spencer shows in his alarming new pamphlet, Islam, Religion of Bigots, has some great, you know, things in there. And someone handed me this, too. I don't know who did that. This looks really good, too. <laughs> um, secondly, join ACT for America. It is an American conservative political organization founded in 2007 by Brigitte Gabrielle, a Christian Lebanese woman who I admire very well to promote national security and defeat terrorism. It has been described as a central player and a force multiplier in promoting state laws, banning Sharia law in the United States. It's a nonprofit, nonpartisan, grassroots organization with nearly 300,000 members and over 1,000 chapters. Um, 
Warren went, mentioned the refugee resettlement program. And that's a great thing because it keeps track of the refugees coming in and knowing where they are because it's such a hush-hush secret thing. They don't want to tell us. So that helps us know to mobilize the citizens to when these meetings are so we can pressure our elected officials. And I know a lot of you are sitting there like Brigitte says, you know, what's one person going to do? One person can do a lot. And she said that these elected officials, she asked them one time, well, how many times, how many phone calls or how many emails does it take before you put an issue as a priority on your list? They said 40 to 50 because they think that each person that calls or each person that sends an email represents 1,000 voters, other voters that sit there and do nothing or are too afraid to speak up. So one person can do a lot. Um, they passed two resolutions in North Carolina and South Carolina allowing the states to block refugees from coming to their states. You know, we the people hold the power over our elected officials. ACT is also working in Congress to stop Obama from bringing refugees into our country. They're working on a parallel bill in the Senate hoping that we have a new president next year who will stop these refugees and make America great again. <laughs> so, I'll leave you with one quote. The world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those who watch them without doing anything. Albert Einstein. Thank you so much.